you've learned about how to position yourself and focus for consistency in calls, but what kind of things will you be calling? Welcome to the lesson on playing actions. When you're ready to begin a rally, a pre-service scan is crucial. This is done to make sure there are no last second substitutions coming to the line or that a coach isn't requesting a timeout that an R2 does not see. Make sure your line judges are in place and that all the players are on the court. Check for players tying shoes, wiping wet spots from the floor, etc. But do not allow non-safety related things like huddles, fixing hair, or walking slowly to change the tempo of your match. Use this opportunity to determine the alignment of both teams. Are the setters front row or back row? Is the libero about to come off the floor? Do you see any alignment violations that you can signal discreetly to your R2? Is there a potential screen on the serving side? Begin your scan with the server and line judge. Come across the serving team's bench and court, check the R2, check the receiving team's bench and court, your other line judge, and then return to the R2 to make sure they are in ready position. Your entire scan should take about two seconds. The serve is the first action of the rally. It is authorized by the R1 once everyone is ready to play. The player in service position number one is the current server. The R1 must judge the contact of the serve. The serve must be hit with one hand and the ball must pass over the net and between the antennas. Once the serve has been authorized by the R1's beckon for serve, signal number 15, the server has five seconds to contact the ball. During each term of service, the server is allowed one reserve. If the server tosses the ball and catches it or lets it fall to the ground, the referee should whistle twice show the reserve signal, number 19, and reauthorize the serve with a new whistle and beckon. On the first team contact or hit, multiple contacts are allowed provided they are made in one attempt to play the ball. If a player contacts the ball in two separate attempts, blow your whistle, award the point, and signal a multiple contact. A first contact may not be a caught or thrown ball. The difference between these two types of violations is important. A multiple contact usually results of under control of the volleyball, whereas a caught or thrown ball is more typically a result of over control of the volleyball. Some referees errantly blow their whistles on the first contact because it is a multiple contact and then realizing they cannot signal a multiple contact, signal a caught or thrown ball instead. Do not be that referee. If you errantly blow your whistle on the first contact because it is a legal multiple contact, award a replay due to your inadvertent whistle. Do not punish a team for your mistake. In order to make these judgments, you must be able to see the contact. Do not whistle a contact you think you saw illegally or that you infer to be illegal only call the illegal contacts you see. In this video, a player contacts a ball quickly with his left hand followed by his right. This play should not be whistled as it is a legal multiple contact on the first team hit. The second and third contacts may possibly result in a multiple contact fault or a caught or thrown ball. The judgment of the caught or thrown ball is the same as on the first contact. For the multiple contact fault, you now have to pay more attention to how the player contacts the ball. If the player contacts the ball twice in succession, this may be a multiple contact fault. How strict you are in calling these types of faults will depend on a number of factors. Every governing body in volleyball has developed a set of ball handling guidelines to help officials judge when to make calls and when to stay out of the match. The NFHS ball handling guidelines can be found in the casebook on pages 96 through 102. No matter which rule set you look at, there are a number of consistent points. First, you must only judge the contacts you see. If you are screened from a contact and have no assistance from your partner, 
then you cannot judge the contact, no matter how suspicious it looks. Do not use spin, player technique, body position, noise, the reactions of spectators or participants, or any other factor to make your decision. Avoid automatic calls that might look funny but are not illegal. Second, call only the obvious violations. Calling too many multiple contact violations draws the teams out of the match. Examine the level of the teams and call the most egregious faults. Leading from the second point, be more lenient on spectacular plays. If you find yourself thinking, wow, how did she get to that ball? And the setter has a minor bobble when she makes the contact, be more liberal in your judgment. Allow a slight bobble on an athletic second contact to a teammate, but do not necessarily show the same leniency on a contact that becomes an attack. Watch this video and notice how the setter on the left side of the net and the left front player on the right side of the net play the ball. Was anything about their play illegal? <laughs> The setter completed a one-handed set. This is often an automatic call by officials as a caught or thrown ball, but the player releases the ball just as quickly as if he had set it with two hands. The quick ricochet that occurs off the left front player is also often an automatic call of a caught or thrown ball. His positioning is awkward, but at no point did he catch or throw the ball, nor did it contact him multiple times. His quick reaction kept the ball legally in play. The first referee was not influenced by the technique of either player, nor by the questioning gesture of the setter on the left when the player on the right wasn't called for a caught or thrown ball. Now that we've talked about the contacts you might see on either side of the net, let's talk about where the teams are allowed to play. The playing space for a team is defined by the team's side of the court and is separated by the plane of the net. The plane of the net is the territory where, with certain restrictions, both teams may play the ball. While the ball is entirely in the yellow space, it belongs solely to the team on the right. Once any part of the round ball passes into the plane of the net, then the team on the left is allowed to play it. When the ball passes into the green space, it belongs solely to the team on the left. There are a few exceptions in which a team may play the ball while it is in their opponent's space, but we'll get into those in a moment. Blocking is defined to be the action of a player close to the net that deflects a ball coming from the opponent by reaching higher than the top of the net at the moment of contact. A block may involve wrist action provided there is no prolonged contact. There are three defined types of blocks. A block attempt is a blocking motion wherein the blocker does not touch the ball. Anyone except the libero may attempt to block. A completed block is a block attempt that results in a touch on the ball. Only front row players are allowed to complete a block. Lastly, a collective block is a block executed by more than one player in close proximity. If any member of a collective block touches the ball, then the ball is considered to have been touched by all players in the block. Therefore, a collective completed block must be comprised of only front row players in order to be legal. In this video, the ball contacts the head of the blocker on the left. Although his head may not have been higher than the net, his hands were reaching above the height of the net. This constitutes a collective completed block. When the ball is in the plane of the net and players from both sides are attempting to play it, there are a variety of outcomes that may occur. First, if front row players for both teams contact the ball simultaneously while it is in the plane of the net, the situation is called a joust. 
This is not a fault unless one of the teams has already used its three contacts. If a joust occurs at the net, the person who is considered to have last touched the ball is determined by the direction the ball goes. For example, if the ball goes to the yellow side, then the green player must have been the last person to touch it. If one or both of the players is a back row player, then a back row violation has occurred. We will study this more in a future lesson on back row play. There are a few select times when a player may reach into the opponent's space to play the ball. These are outlined in Rule 9 6, 4. They include when the attacking team has used all three hits. In the scenario shown, the green player must have been allowed to make the third contact before the yellow player touches the ball. When the attacking team has had the opportunity to complete the attack. This means, in the judgment of the first referee, the green player was sending the ball to the yellow side even if it wasn't the third team contact. And lastly, when the ball is falling near the net and in the referee's judgment, no legal member of the attacking team could make a play on the ball. Here are examples where playing across in the opponent's space is not permitted and is a fault. Signal number five. When a legal member of the green team is nearby to play the ball, when a blocker interferes with a first or second contact that is still on the opponent's side. There are also examples where playing across the net is an offensive fault. In these examples, the green team is on offense. The offensive player attacks the ball in the opponent's space. Or, the offensive player tries to bring the ball back from being entirely in the opponent's space. This concludes the fourth lesson about the first referee. Please be sure to spend time in your rule book with rules 8 and 9. Please mark this lesson complete and continue to the next lesson, Sanctions. Thank you.